starting gun for the big class yachts, amongst whom is Britannia, with His Majesty the King racing on board her. Lord Camrose's cutter Cambria was first over the line. She's very closely followed by Britannia, Lulworth third, Mr. Davis's schooner the westward, and Whitehead the second. There's Britannia beating away to the westward. restoration of the century. This is the amazing story of how Lulworth, the world's largest gaff cutter, was returned to the splendour and charm that had made her a legend in the 1920s. Over a decade of racing, Lulworth competed around the coast of Great Britain against the four other members of the famous Big Five, Britannia, White Heather II, Westwood and Shamrock. Now, after an absence of seven decades, Lulworth is back in the water, elegant, majestic and sublime. My feeling is, uh, you can't describe it. This year my life was like a fairy tale. So much emotion, so many things happened, so many warm receptions everywhere, so it was really great. Watching this fantastic yacht under full sail, you can see why her current owner is so moved. And it is not just the way that Lulworth looks which attracts people so much. Lulworth's history is an inspirational tale to warm the cockles of the heart. Ten years of successes in the British regattas, abandoned in a yard during World War II, used as a houseboat in the mud of the River Hamble for 40 years, moved to Italy in 1990, for a stalled restoration, and finally rescued by Dutchman Johan von den Brühle in 2001. This is a story worth telling, a tale of the Greek muse of dancing, Terpsichore, Lulworth's original name. The tale of a queen of the seas who went into exile and seemed destined to die. The tale of a man who, the moment he came across this abandoned lady, immediately felt it his duty to save her, and then to bring her back to her original and quite extraordinary splendour. My passion for the sea. You know, it all started when I was a young kid. My father built, built me my first dinghy, then I started sailing. Later on, when I was uh, working, I had a lot of power boats. And after that, coming to a more a quiet period in my life, around my 50s, then I had time to enjoy the real beauty uh, of uh, classic boats. The reason for a classic boat is that uh, they have charm, they have uh, quality, they have uh, style and you know it also attracts a lot of beautiful women, huh? you know that. I was looking for a classic yacht in 1999 in Antibes. I was going around with some brokers and then I found Iduna and with Iduna it all started. She was built and she was used by Dutch people and as some Dutchman you like that very much with the Dutch flag on, uh, on the stern. Then uh, the whole restoration was also done by the same people I met when I found the boat. And if I hadn't met them at that moment, and I mean Giuseppe and Elisabetta Longo, then the boat, uh, I wouldn't have restored the boat, to be honest. Giuseppe, born in England of an Italian father and an English mother, moved to Italy in 1992. Elisabetta, from Pisa, studied accountancy but much preferred sailing. Two stories and two different worlds united by a passion and love for the sea and for boats. A life together which has seen them achieve something that few couples could ever dream of. And it all started when they met Johan in Antibes. One day Johan approached us and said that he wanted to buy the boat and uh, would like us to restore this, uh, this very well-known Dutch motor sailing boat. I explained to him at the time that I didn't have that kind of experience. I only worked in uh, 
a couple of small yards previously to that. Um, but obviously, um, he could see the potential and myself and Elizabeth as a couple that maybe could sort of bring this project uh, to an end. Norwood was in a very desperate, desperate state. I stepped in with uh, my friend Giuseppe Longo in this uh, creature and we saw all these beams coming together there and the size of it, the scale. So at that moment, in my heart I already knew I have to do this. But I had to ask my friend, because he is the real the restorer. So I asked him, hey, what do you think? Can you do it? Mm, he looked, of course we can do it, as he always says. But he already had proven he could. So uh, we uh, decided to go along. And within a half an hour, we were talking to the management of the yard where she was, and we made a decision to buy her immediately. The whole story started to get more interesting. At the same time, we began to discover the whole story of this boat why it had been abandoned, uh, where it had come from, where it had been built. Um, and that's when we decided then, at that moment, we wanted to take the boat to Via Regia and put it alongside Iduna, which was in the last year of her restoration. So we completed this, uh, the buying of the boat through the various parties involved. Uh, the boat arrived in Via Regia. So anyway, with, with the, uh, the boat now in the yard, we could sit back and reflect on, on what we were gonna do with this boat. We bought the boat, we had all these bits and pieces. Now it was a decision of, how we were going to restore the boat. And uh, I think it took him about two minutes to decide that the way we were going to do it was the original way, using all the old materials. Whether it took longer and whether it cost him a bit more, I think he was, it was a challenge for him. Uh, to, to go the old way and Jan being a person who likes challenges, uh, that was the way we decided to go. What is beginning here is one of the largest restorations ever undertaken, both in terms of the condition of the boat and her dimensions. The Lulworth is 46 metres overall, the hull 37 metres, 6 metres 60 in the beam. Her displacement is 190 tonnes and she draws five and a half metres. To say that the restoration of Lulworth is unique anywhere in the world is no exaggeration. The last of the big five is about to be reborn, to become again exactly what she was in the 1920s. Those next six months to probably June 2002, we sent sourcing materials, sourcing the various craftsmen, advertising for people that could, could use the arts and the skills of maybe the 1920s. Uh, we had people from all over the world ringing us up from New Zealand, Poland, America. And that's how far we had to go to find these people who had the skills and the knowledge to, to help us with this, this immense restoration. Um, I think we ended up with something like 16 different nationalities working on the boat at any one time. Some of them didn't even speak the same language as the next person. That was quite interesting as well. We had Palestinians working alongside Americans, Cubans, Polish, American, New Zealand. I mean, it was just an incredible sphere of people. We had Sicilian shipwrights putting up the planking. You know, I mean, it was just, how can I say, it was a buzz of activity and it was, it was a challenge every day. Apart from the question of finding a common language, which in our yard is mainly English, behind everything there was a lot of logistical organization, finding a flat, getting the various day permits and all the rest. I've got to be honest to have Elisabetta backing backing me up on that as well, because that was one part of the job I wouldn't have enjoyed. I enjoyed being out on the, on the yard floor, talking to the guys, organizing and making sure that everything was running to clockwork. I mean, I would say on a restoration, 90% of a restoration is common sense, especially if you have the right people around you.
Spring 2002. Now the restoration can start. And Lulworth is not in good shape. The 40 years spent on a muddy bottom have left their mark, irreparably damaging the deck and hull planking, the ribs, the deck beams and the cross bearers. After patiently checking every single part of the boat, the work gets underway, starting from the steel frame, the backbone and the ribs, the floor timbers and the frames. A key figure in this part of the restoration was Edvaldo Paoli. This enigmatic Tuscan led a team of seven metal workers that cut and soldered all the sheet metal and the original beams no less than 750 metres of steel ribs and some 8 tonnes of flooring and keel. The figures make impressive reading and it is almost impossible to convey in words how hard this job was. Meticulous precision was required to restore the 40 frames that could still be used. The remaining 40 frames were reconstructed, fully respecting the style and the technique of the 1920s. Every single piece of metal was hot galvanised, a system that used to be the most important way of protecting the structural element of boats from corrosion. After months of labour, the steel structure is finished. More than a boat. It looks like the skeleton of a huge dinosaur coming to life before our eyes. If Giuseppe Longo was helped by his wife Elisabetta in handling bureaucracy and administration, his right arm in the yard was Gerald Reed. Now captain of Lulworth, Gerald started out as a mechanical engineer on diesel and gas turbine engines. His involvement can be traced back to the time he first teamed up with Giuseppe in 1999, and Gerald went on to play a key role in designing and installing the systems on board Lulworth. My first time I met Giuseppe was uh, scuba diving in a shop I worked in in Pisa, um, instructed scuba diving. Um, known Elisabetta, met Giuseppe through Elisabetta. Then he called, called me one day, I was working for Caterpillar at the time. Um, he asked me to offer me a job as engineer on Iduna for the build engineer, and I refused it the first time. I said, no, I really don't want to get involved, you know. Um, then about six months later, I was doing I was doing some engine work on Iduna for the Caterpillar engine. Um, then I went, and he offered me the same job again. I said, "Why not? Give it a shot. See what happens. Have some fun." He is a, a great man. I met him seven years ago, and. Uh, I didn't know that he never sailed before, but then I found out and we learned him sailing on Iduna. And then we also found out that he has a natural talent. He has a natural feeling for sailing. I was fortunate through the build, the build of the Iduna, knowing about the engineering. Johan gave me an opportunity to be to be, he asked me when we were doing the sea trials, would you like to skipper the boat? Oh, I'll give anything a shot once for fun. Um, I, as far as sailing experience, I had none before that. Um, as, far as, as far as windsurfing, things like that, and I wasn't very good at that. So, um, Johan gave me the opportunity. I went ahead, gave it the best I could. I had a good time four years on Iduna. And now he's given me the opportunity to come on this, on Lilworth which is probably a once-in-a-lifetime once opportunity for anyone, much, much less me, not having that much experience. Another long and important chapter in this restoration was obviously the interior. Here too, there was just one objective, 
to faithfully respect the original plans. Easier said than done. Thanks to the cooperation of the Camper and Nicholson studio in England, interior plans dating back to 1925 were found. These made clear how the stern area and central saloon were laid out. Unfortunately, the plans of the entire forward part of the yacht, including the galley and crew cabins, had been lost, together with information on many other details and finishings. I suppose one of the most complicated things about the, the restoration of Lulworth is, is the fact that you don't find these things, you don't buy them off the shelf in, in, in your local uh, hardware shop or your local ship chandler. These things have to be fabricated, these things have to be designed. The bit, I'm talking about the bits you're missing for the boat. I mean, it's not a case, like I said, it's like a supermarket. You say, I'll have three of those, four of those. And that's where we were very lucky to find people like Fra Stefano Fagioni, Francesco Bartel. I mean, Stefano we'd already used as our interior designer on the Iduna and uh, we were very, very happy with what he'd done. His father had been a very well-known man in the classic boating world as an architect as well. So for us to call on Stefano was, was a great help uh, to fill in the missing pieces, the missing bits of the jigsaw puzzle that we were missing. I met Giuseppe Longo and Johann Vandenbrühler in 1999, just before restoration started on Iduna, his first classic yacht, a 30 meter of 1939. I met him with my father, Ugo Fagioni, the founder of this studio that I've been running for many years and one of the greatest promoters of classic yacht restoration a kind of art that has involved many owners, not the last of them are Johann van den Brühle. It was a kind of challenge to myself, a challenge I took up almost completely single-handed, one I tackled almost free-handed, using my own materials, my own instruments, the ones my father left me. Also because the studio has the tradition of still producing freehand plans, which is rather rare. We won the challenge, but it was a big one, for it went from the design of the overall plans to the designing of the various missing boiseries. The furniture, the hinges, handles, keys and small details, all with the same spirit. The project lasted many years and it didn't end on paper but involved over the period a series of visits to the yard, at least one or two a week. So we were in very close contact with all the craftsmen who carried out this restoration to perfection. I felt a bit like an orchestra conductor in a splendid concert. Lulworth's furnishings are warm and original, beautifully made both in design and the quality of material. In the aft area is the owner's stateroom with twin beds. This is a very elegant cabin and very much in keeping with the times. Three superior guest suites are located between the stateroom and the saloon. These are accessed by a dramatic curving corridor of ancient mahogany panels. The saloon is the room that most reflects the taste and elegance of Lulworth's original owner. Every piece, apart from the lighting and the dining, is original. What you see here is exactly how the saloon would have looked in 1920. Moving forward, we find the rebuilt galley and then the crew area, which is used as a sail locker during races. Again, everything possible has been done to retain an authentic air of seamless continuity. Any fixture or fitting that could be reused is now back in place. 
I started way back in 2002. I was a bit skeptical at first. We started by dismantling all the authentic parts and rebuilding them. Over time, the glue had come unstuck, so it was very easy to dismantle them. Once we'd stripped down all the pieces, one at a time of course, we removed all the old varnish, cleaned up all the joints, and then started reconstructing the furniture and furnishings. To achieve all of this required an incredibly thorough process as the interior areas of Lulworth were restored and pre-assembled in full size alongside the yacht. This allowed the craftsmen to do their job as if they were actually inside Lulworth. In the interior all the um, panelling work was all original uh, mahogany but we've had to obviously make um, a lot of new panels and um, replicate the old panels. So we've used 30-year-old um, Honduras mahogany, which is quite rare these days also. Currently I'm making uh, some half models for the owner. Uh, this is very interesting because I'm, I'm using the original planking from, the, from Lulworth uh, to create these half models for the owner. So uh, that's another diverse part of my job. Once the metal skeleton of the boat was complete, it was over to the carpenters to start positioning the planks, the skin of the hull. Although half of the original planking was well preserved, it was not thick enough to meet Lloyd's class requirements. So 300 new Honduras mahogany planks were bought with an average length of 14 metres, 20 centimetres wide and 7 centimetres thick. These mahogany planks were cut to make them more tapered fore and aft. Some were shaped by hand, softened first by wet rags and then curved over a naked flame. They were then fixed to the hull with 9,800 bronze bolts. It was June the 14th, 2004, when the last piece of planking was bolted into place. A landmark moment in a landmark project. Una volta che il once the carpenters had finished work on the planking, we went on board and started laying this flooring, which was wonderful. It was a bit tricky and a bit boring, because the first time you do it, you have to work out how it's done. But once we found the method, it all went smoothly. Once the flooring was finished, we started drawing up the layout using plans produced by the architect Fagioni that were obviously based on the furniture and all the pre-existing elements. And then we started reassembling. We stripped down here and reassembled there. Bit by bit, we stripped down what was here and then reassembled it on board. Apart from the finishing touches, the interior too was complete. What had not long before been the naked skeleton of a dinosaur was now fast taking on the look of a fantastic racing yacht. The time was right to work on the deck. This involved positioning and corking the planks of North American white pine, which measured about six centimetres thick. The outermost plank, the stringer and the king plank were in teak. 
Overall, it took a team of seven people four months to complete another chapter in this exceptional restoration. I would say on deck, taking off maybe the four winches, um, she's 80% original. She really is. I mean, all those bits and pieces were on her in 1920. We were able to save them, restore them, and put them back. Uh, that's how minimalistic we wanted to keep it, by putting on very, very few winches and very, very few modern necessities that are, that are required nowadays by, by, by modern sailing boats. We wanted to bring this thing back to, to how it was in 1920 to show people that you can still sell these boats nowadays. The air conditioning system, we don't have. Heating and cooling, we do that by a natural or a blown ventilation system which has heat exchangers put in for the summertime I'll use one boiler to use the hot water to, to circulate through a heat exchanger and come through the air passes over and is heated. Um, for the summertime I'll take salt water and run it through another heat exchanger which the ventilated air will be pushed over to be cooled so that way you get a change in the temperature there. The main engine wasn't on board anymore. It was originally a Gardner engine, which is a very low horsepower, very low RPM engine, and we replaced it with a, a more modern, lighter weight engine and higher horsepower, it's a 370 horsepower engine, um, just for uh, saving of weight on the vessel as much as possible. Um, the generator, we do have a generator on board for when we're, for any kind of the 220 used or, or the charging of the batteries for a 24 volt system, and it's a small Northern Lights uh, generator. For the steering system on the vessel, we've kept the original steering system. Um, we had everything as far as from the pedestal to the wheel, all the way down to the steering quadrant down below. Um, we sent it off, had it some repairs done to it, uh, checked out uh, like a, a revision on, on the pedestal itself and the gears. Um, we haven't changed anything. So we're keeping her as she was in 1920 with a, uh, a racked and pinion steering, direct steering, which is not assisted by hydraulics, no hydraulic, no autopilots. Um, so it's the people on the helm, the watches on the vessel is going to be real watches like they had in 1920, not sit back, push a button, and you cruise and watch for lights. Another person who used his experience and insight to ensure that the original Lulworth was fully respected was Francesco Bartel from Florence. At the time of the project, Francesco was the owner of a 10-meter classic called Mopi and shared the Lulworth team's passion for perfection. Most of the deck equipment was made in aluminium bronze, a very resistant material, but one that's complicated to work with compared to the brass or bronze we normally use. It's a demanding job, also because it demands greater precision, because the safety of the boat depends on it. The components all underwent traction tests and, thanks to the quality of the founding, the results were positive.
Francesco as well had a, a great passion for boats as he was restoring a boat called Mopi at the same time as well. And he jumped on board with us and, and was fantastic in reproducing some of the old light fittings and some of the intricate pieces of silverwork that we were missing from the boat at the time. December the 10th, 2005. When Johan arrived in Via Reggio for one of his many visits to the yard, Giuseppe had a surprise in store for him. Having worked around the clock, the team had finished laying the deck and Giuseppe was delighted to show Johan the splendid results for the first time. This is probably one of the most important parts of the boat. We hope this is going to work, but nobody can really tell us until we're out there trying this. But this, yeah. is, this is many people's ideas together, and we've come up with this solution here. So, fingers crossed. It looks nice yeah. anyway. Before we see Lulworth underway again, let us first take a step back in time to the end of the First World War. A conflict that had left all Europe's people, victors and losers alike, with a great sense of disorientation and a ravaged economy. In 1919, George V, King of Great Britain, decided to cheer his subjects up by bringing his wonderful yacht Britannia back into action. Um, after the First World War, um, a certain Mr. Lee decided to build a yacht that could compete with uh, the Royal Yacht Britannia. And uh, he gave order in 1919 to build Lowward. And the whole story uh, can be told the best by uh, our historian, Mr. Andrew uh, Rogers. Will you please uh, join me, Andrew, sure. and uh, tell the story about Mr. Lee? Well, Mr. Lee was actually, a, I think, a pretty brave man because he was, um, he was the only one to actually go ahead and build a completely new, huge gaff cutter to race against Britannia. There's probably the reason for that. It was that at that time because of the shortage of materials and uh, the fact that the labour force was so far gone. There was the expense of building a yacht like that was beyond belief. It was three times what it would have cost before the war. You mean it? You really? Yeah, that expensive. So, a bit like you, he was a bit of a brave man to go ahead with that. Andrew, can you tell me something how uh, Lubert uh, went on? The first three years, she had it pretty tough. She had a rigging problems. She actually had uh, problems with her mast. She had a steel mast, huh? Eh? Yes, yeah, she was given a steel mast because they couldn't get the quantity of wood needed for a mast of this size. Oh. You have to understand that Lulworth is the equivalent of a 17 story apartment block. Yeah. So a mast like that, a piece of wood like that, at the end of the war was very difficult to find. But by 1924 she had got a wooden mast, the rigging had been sorted, and then by the 1925 season she won against all the great yachts. She beat Shamrock, she beat White Heather, Westwood, and even Britannia, just as Richard Lee had hoped, was left in the wake of Lulworth. By about 1927, 1928, there was new rigs coming in, the Bermudan rig, boats such as Astra, Candida. These large yachts came in as well to the scene. And of course, they all evolved into the J-Class by the early 1930s. And at that point, Lulworth took her bow. Then came the Second World War, and she was left in the Camper and Nicholson yard in Gosport. She was bombed, which damaged her to such an extent that it really wasn't possible for anyone at that time, after the Second World War, to actually completely fit her out to go and sail again. So she was bought by, rescued, we should say, by yeah. a couple called Richard and Rene Lucas, 
who bought the yacht and converted her into a houseboat on the River Hamble. She stayed there right up until the late 1980s. Um, after her husband passed away in the 1960s, she continued to live on board. So uh, Mrs. Lucas has been very important to uh, the survival of the yacht. I think it's fair to say that without Mrs. Lucas, we wouldn't be sitting here. That's true. She preserved it along with her husband and long after her husband had passed away, she continued to keep the yacht in amazing condition. She didn't throw things away. She didn't completely tear it apart and put new decoration in as others might have done. She's been the caretaker. She has kept this boat for us. I suppose that's what we do with the book you're writing, preserving history. That's the idea, basically, yes. We've gone back as far as we can. We've searched every archive. We've looked completely through every history book there is. And I think we've made a definitive book on Lulworth in terms of history. And once the book is finished, will also be a fantastic record of everything that's been done to restore her to what she is today. And hopefully what it's like to sail her too. Great, I look forward. And so, at last, Lulworth is ready to leave the yard. But with a boat of 180 tonnes, every movement has to be calculated with care and attention. To move this gigantic gaff cutter out of the yard, the first job was to construct a launching cradle, 16 metres long and 5 metres wide. Lulworth would lie in this steel cradle until she was actually put in the water. But that wasn't all. Once the cradle was constructed around the hull, the boat had to be lifted up. This too was a very difficult and delicate operation. The slightest slip would have spelled disaster. Lulworth had to be raised by about 70 centimetres to allow the trailer to be slid underneath. We couldn't launch the boat in Via Reggio. We had to go to La Spezia for the depth of the keel. She is 5 meter 20 underwater. And when, when we left the yard, it was in uh, carnival time. So everybody partying and we were just concentrating on lifting the boat on a truck, hydraulic, a truck with uh, I think 72 wheels. And then with this truck, we went all the way 5 kilometers to the port on a pontoon and believe me that it, she was so beautiful coming out of the shed and that's the first time we really, all of us, could see her completely with the sheer lines, the, her beauty. On Sunday, February the 5th, 2006, the efforts of all who had worked on the project were about to bear fruit. Slowly but surely, Lulworth emerged from under the canopy that had been her home for over four years. It was a sight that all who were present will cherish forever. Seeing Lulworth no longer covered by the shed was already a very emotional moment. We were really tired, the elastic was really stretched, perhaps almost to breaking point. But seeing her like that gave us the strength to go on. For the restoration work was over, but another phase was starting. The move from dry land to water. The boat came out, all this wonderful keel that you see under her, which we couldn't see in the yard, and made her way through the tiny streets of Viareggio. Then they had to cut the power cables, because she's very tall, 10 meters threatened her way through the streets and arrived at the Viareggio dock. There were some anxious moments, but in the end, it all went well.
With Lulworth safely placed on board a giant raft for the trip to La Spezia, the next job was to add her mast and rigging. Transporting the rig to the port of Via Reggio demanded maximum concentration given the almost titanic dimensions of the boat. Lulworth's mast is an incredible 52 metres equal to a 17 storey building. Then there is 27 metres of beam, 16 metres of gaff, 20 metres of spinnaker pole and a bowsprit of 9.5 metres. We decided that we were going to pick the 1926 sail plan as our reference point and, and, and build to that. I'd already been informed that Spencer had built the original rig back in the 90s for the, for the original clients of the boat before it was brought to Italy. And I rang them up and asked them uh, what the situation was with the rig, whether they still had it, whether they'd sold it or, or thrown it away. They informed me they'd sold it to the Britannia project, uh, a replica that was being built in Russia. So I approached the owner of this project who, within two days, uh, rang me back and said he'd, he'd like to sell it back to us, uh, which was very encouraging because there were so many original bits of that stood around, you know, the gaff saddle and various bits of the, the fiction fittings was, were, were, were low with original pieces and we fished out in the mud. So uh, we were very excited about that and we bought the rig back and then we had it transported to Italy, which was uh, an immense job. I think it had a police escort, didn't it, from England all the way down to Via Reggio, which is quite something else when you, when you think of the size of this thing, 35 metre bottom mast and then the top mast on top. Um, but that was an incredible coup for us to get all that back with the standing rigging and the blocks and everything else. It was a big piece of the puzzle, solved. As is traditional, <laughs> Johan, as the owner, placed a gold coin at the bottom of Lulworth's mast before it was lifted right, on board. This was a mint gold sovereign from 1920, which cost a thousand euros in today's money. Buried treasure, you might say. Valentine's Day 2006 will live long in the memory of all involved with Lulworth as she was transported to La Spezia for launching. Because of the tight security at this naval dockyard, no film cameras were allowed. Fortunately, the authorised photographs capture the romance of this defining moment in yachting history. When we entered uh, the Arsenal, which was quite experienced, entering a military base and at the time we were informed that we were the first foreign flagged vessel ever to use these facilities, which was quite an exciting, exciting thing, going past all the, the big battleships and cruisers, all the crews on top, watching us come in on this raft. Um, as we went into the dry dock, we were met by probably six or seven admirals from the Italian fleet who'd heard about this thing and all, they'd all come in to sort of meet the owner and congratulate him on the, uh, on, on the restoration of the boat. No, again, it was just a, 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 a great thing because everybody from taking the boat out of the yard to putting the boat on the raft and going to, to, going to La Spezia and finally put her in the water and, and bring her back to life. I mean, that was it. Well, that's where she is alive, is in the water. Pure emotion. I won't say it was better than sex, but it was something like that. <laughs> the world's largest gaff cutter was now in the water again, ready to fill her sails with wind. It was time to get Lulworth underway to race her as she was last raced back in the 1920s. This tough but exciting task was in the hands of Gerald Reed, the former engineer turned skipper. Having been with the project from the very outset and also been the captain of Iduna, Gerald was the natural choice to stand at Lulworth's helm. We nominated Gerald as captain of the boat 
People have always asked me why we went for somebody who didn't have the experience of saying one of these boats. Gerald had been with us from the, the reconstruction of Iduna. He'd captained Iduna. And we both felt, myself and Jan, that he was a very capable person, a very quick learner. And I don't think there was anybody else out there at the time that could have uh, sailed a boat like this who'd had more experience than he had sailing the boat. So it was an obvious choice for us to, to pick people within our sort of uh, how can I say, a hardcore group of, of people that helped us in the very beginning and give them the opportunity to sell the boat. And, and Gerald always said to me, if he didn't think he was capable of doing it, you would have held his hand up and we would have found somebody else. But he sold the boat, he's still sailing the boat, and yeah, he's learning a lot and getting better, and so is the boat. As the days turned into weeks, Lulworth's date with destiny approached. The entire yachting world was waiting impatiently to see her race again at the Argentario Sailing Week in mid-June. But the long hours of practice were interrupted at the end of April when the Italian Navy invited Lulworth to Leghorn for the 23rd edition of the Naval Academy Trophy. Here, the AIVE awarded the Lulworth team the prize for the best restoration of 2006. Thank you very much, all of you. It was to be the first of many awards. The days leading up to the first race for 76 years were tense. Could the crew live up to the awesome task that lay ahead? No one alive had manoeuvred a gaff rig of these dimensions, combined with speeds of at least 16 knots. There is no break on Lulworth. The first time helming her yourself, this creature, at 46 meters, with so much power on top, 950 square meters of sail, and started sailing. Oh, it, it's really, that's something in you, you can't describe. With so many crew members around, everybody still looking for their place and not everybody knowing what uh, to do. But it was a sensation. And of course, it was scary as well. But, you know, as the day went on, you felt better and more secure. <laughs> Emotions started to relive again off, you know, with the fact that Argentaria was coming up, uh, which was going to be the first regatta that Lulworth had participated in in, in 76 years. Um, and one of the boats that she used to race in those days was Canberra, was going to be there as well, along with Mariette. So for us to go down and try the boat out against such stiff competition was quite an exciting thought as well. Um, we went out and uh, we raced Cambria, we raced Mariette. We had some 
good days sailing. We beat Marriott, we beat Gambia one day. Uh, even though it's a very, very scary moment sailing this big boat without having the experience of sailing her a lot before we got down there was, was quite exciting. The racing season continued with the Imperia and Cannes regattas, ending with the classic Wall de Saint-Tropez. Wherever she raced and berthed, Lulworth aroused wonder and admiration. And the media too devoted exceptional space to this restoration, with more than 60 specialist and general titles from all over the world covering her historic return to the water. Everyone involved had good reason to be pleased with Lulworth's first season. When uh, we, were in, we arrived in Viareggio and had the boat in the yard, at that moment I didn't know how long it would take. We were discussing two years and a small budget. It ended up with five years and an enormous budget. But anyhow, I can't uh, tell you how much I enjoyed all those years. I've been traveling a lot every month from Holland to Viareggio for a week. And believe me, that and to work with all these people and to think about all the details and to and to organize all this in the art so that was so much fun and uh, really it was one of the one of the best parts of my life